I did is took this, this halftone dot pattern, transferred it, and, and then I just wrapped it around without the green. So we'll rub this, the back of this image with oil until, until it's transparent or until it looks wet. As I started to put together these, these images, after I started using photography in my work, I started putting together images in this, in this way where essentially you have um, parts that beg the question, why do, why do these things go together? And for me, I think that was so absorbing and interesting to put unlike things together or things together that why, why are they together? And the truth is, I like to do that. <laughs> Sometimes I think that um, as far as concept for me, it's very intuitive because it does, the question becomes, does it fire the imagination? And I know that that's, that's a vague way to describe it because it's relative. So one person may say, well, that doesn't fire anything in my imagination. But I, I can't know that. I try very hard to entertain, and, and I hope that I do, but I can't guarantee that I can make that connection, that, that imaginative response for every viewer. All I can do is try my best. A lot of people ask me, did I just scratch away at the image after, after the image was put on? And the answer is no. If I do that in Photoshop, I can see what it's going to look like. It's kind of a printmaking technique. And so in printmaking, you know, you have to keep register. And it's the same principle here. I was working in this format for a while where I was using multi-panel pieces. Now, some people gave me a hard time with that because it's not a traditional triptych or... It's a very untraditional un format, but, but to be able to move panels around that way, literally, you know, and, and, and even take a panel from one painting and put it on another, um, I liked that openness to be able to do such a thing. Off and then take my tape off, and we're all finished. Now I can also I get the print sides printed too, so that you get a seamless wraparound image. You told me back in December It's not a race to anywhere The skies of wind blown past our window We've seen them there I've seen them there But I still, I'm trying to entertain people and I'm trying to do that visually. 
it's very easy to lose people with contemporary art. Um, there's a lot of art out there that, that is trying very difficult to, to educate people on, on things and, and I think that's, that's fine, but I think that you have to give people um, something to thrill them, to excite them, to make them, to draw them in, so to speak. And uh, one of my favorite artists is actually Walt Disney. Uh, I admire the man immensely and he said that he uh, he believed that entertainment should, could, should come first. That if he could educate people, then that should come second. A daydream in snow, light and sound is far. This fairy man is never... This particular train is, is a model of Walt Disney's backyard train called the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. This painting called, called Crossing the Needles has a very western feel to it. But in fact, this boxcar is the boxcar that would go here, um, translated into silhouettes, and then placed in, in, in wood pattern. It has the Joshua tree. It has the horse, the train stamp, the steam train, very important in, in the history of, of this country. My mother was a painter to some extent when I was young, off and on, but I, she would sometimes get things for me to do while she was working. And um, when I got to undergraduate school, I, I started as a graphic design major. And um, it was during the second semester that I took an elective of drawing because I love drawing. I actually had no intentions of taking painting because Although you, you wouldn't know it by looking around me now, I, I actually, in art, was sort of afraid of color. This painting called Quiet Revolution. Um, it, now, this uh, yellow area and black mark were much more graphic. One main thing that changed is that there were three versions, there were three sleeves here that went across and I, I used this one, but again, just I'm building upon what, what, what was a painting, using parts of the old painting and then, and then continuing. I call black witches, they're in the, they have the black costume. And then two, red witches in the red costume and intended to be two of the white witches which I have one here and, this, and you'll notice a smaller format. Um, where those come from is a, um, a, a film idea that I have that, that's been long in the works called Becoming and um, I made the, I've started making the costumes for it and um, there's three different witch costumes, one red, one black, and one white. Red symbolizing aggression, which becomes the black, which is the unpure state, and then it breaks down into uh, the white, which is returning to the pure state. One of my films is called Faith. It is very ambiguous as to what it is about, but for, and it was very personal. I think art is, is, it serves all of the same purposes as a religion to me. So it was my own way of saying to myself that this is, this is my, my religion. This is what, I, this is the spiritual center of, of me. And it was a whole show. It included photographs and sculpture and installation. 
and the soundtrack and the film and it was a whole multimedia experience and called Faith. Moon Rabbit's Pictures and Tales was actually, I had a very good friend that was, um, he was the, the president of the Minneapolis College of Art and Design when I was there in school. His name was John Slorp. He had the idea in 2000, summer of 2010, he said, you know, in an email, just a passing idea, he said, I think it would be wonderful if you created a book where you can paired your, your work with short stories that would be like a writer's interpretations. You know, here it is in the book, and um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, it was a long route, so to speak, to finish the, the book. I think when we started, the first story that was written uh, by John Slorp, who I mentioned, who had the idea for the book, um, he wrote for this painting, which is called Arrogance. But as we moved forward, I noticed, um, I noticed with some of the other writers that we were getting more of sketches and incomplete stories, and it, and it seemed to be getting too abstract. And of course, the, the thing with the, the book is that I want, I got the feeling very quickly that, uh, that we have to have complete stories with the beginning, middle, and end. And I know there's a very short space to do it, but we really needed that because abstraction is definitely not what we wanted um, because we already have that imagery. That's the purpose of writing the book to begin with, is to, to give a, a story, to give form, to give form to the uh, pictures with the tales. Artist statements are, I've always felt like are funny things because, because, you know, 100 or 200 years, if an artist's work is, survives and has the possibility of being looked at and considered by people, I really believe that it has to stand on its own. You know, it, it people have, because because the artist can't always be there to explain, you know, and and say, well, it's okay because I meant this. It's kind of actually irrelevant. Because um, I guess having, making paintings is like, you know, having, I guess it would be like having a child. I don't have a child. I guess these are all children. But, you, you know, you, you make them and, you, you know, I'm, I'm working with them, trying to mold them. But when I'm done, it has to stand on its own. I can't always be there to say, well, this is what, I meant, you know, and then people are like, oh, okay, now I, I understand, so it's, and that makes it okay to like it or okay to dislike it. I think art has to stand on its own. Mm -hmm.